gone forever. Lost to history, and never again will new fans of the franchise have a chance to play these games. Welcome back Commander. In this video, I take a retrospective look at two Mass Effect games that, unfortunately, are no longer available to play. As always, please make sure you check out my Mass Effect videos on the channel, and if you like it, then like it, and if you love it, then subscribe. Mass Effect Galaxy was released in 2009 for Apple iOS, with the player character taking on the role of Jacob Taylor. Jacob would go on to become a companion character in Mass Effect 2, which would be released a year later, and so this game serves as a kind of prequel. It's good to hear a clear opinion. Sounds like we're two of a kind. That honors me more than you, Commander. Let me know if you need anything. However, it's a side story, and playing the game wasn't required to understand Mass Effect 2, it just helped expand both Jacob and Miranda's backstory within the franchise. During the events of Mass Effect 2, Jacob will tell you a little bit about the mission if you speak to him on the Normandy. What was your proudest career moment? The job I'm proudest of wasn't for the Alliance. Nobody really knows about it. A Batarian group was plotting to release a weaponized virus and kill the Council. Miranda and I stopped it. Jacob is on vacation aboard a cruise ship when it's suddenly boarded by Batarians. Jacob fights off the Batarian pirates and travels to the Citadel to meet his former commanding officer, a Major Derek Izumi. Taylor's trip coincides with the arrival of an ambassador from the Batarian hegemony, Jayeth Amon, who is due to meet the Citadel Council for peace talks. Derek asks Jacob to investigate the Batarians on the Terminus systems. When Jacob arrives at the Neiman Abyss to meet an informant named Miranda Lawson, he is forced to deal with the human pirates who have taken over a local space station. Once he's dealt with the pirate leader, black-eyed Clint Dara, Miranda offers to cooperate with Jacob and gives them three leads to investigate. A Torian arms smuggler who is hiding on Tortuga, the rising of a Batarian army on the planet Beck, which is a departure from the conventional tactics of forming small terrorist cells, and reports of human doctors and scientists being kidnapped by Batarians and taken to the Ankadar orbital platform. Jacob discovers a large stash of Element Zero on Beck, rescues the Asari scientist Batha with the help of a Krogan mercenary named Nax on Ankadar, and infiltrates Ilo's base using a passcode given by Ish, a Salarian contact of Miranda's. After confronting Ilo and learning of his illness, Jacob deduces that the Batarians are working on a biologically engineered disease and Ilo was used by the Batarians as a test subject. Batha synthesizes a vaccine which could neutralize the biological weapon. After being cured of the disease, Ilo reveals that the Batarians intend to unleash it on the Citadel Council through Jaelmon, who has the vaccine. Jacob and Miranda hurry to the Citadel, where they fall the Batarian plot and save the Council. Jaelmon swears vengeance against Jacob and the human race, and is escorted out by Citadel security. Jacob goes on another vacation, and is surprised when Miranda brings a bottle of champagne along to join him. The game was played from a top-down perspective. He had to tilt the phone to move and fire upon the enemies by locking onto them. With Jacob being a biotic, you could use his biotic powers by selecting them from the right. The shooting sections were broken up with conversations that helped drive the narrative forward. During these conversations, you had the opportunity to select your dialogue responses, and although they didn't really have any over effect on the main story, you were able to choose between Renegade and Paragon in Chu Must Effect style. I love this game. It was different, and although it wasn't very well received, IGN scoring it a 5 out of 10 and saying clumsy controls and repetitive action, it served to expand the universe. Not everything in Mass Effect has to be about the Reapers, and this was a Batarian terrorist group attempting to attack the Citadel. IGN were not wrong, it did have repetitive gameplay, but the art style was lovely, and it was almost like playing an interactive cartoon, and it was good to see Jacob as the lead character. He always gets a lot of flack in any Mass Effect poll involving him, and so to have a side story where he's the hero really did him proud. And now he's just reduced to being that boring character again, who cheats on your female shepherd. It's a real shame, as the comics do a great job at expanding the galaxy, and there should be more things like this. Next up, we have a game that's more in line with the Mass Effect visual style. But first, let me know what you think of Jacob's story. Did you get a chance to play it, and did you like it? Whilst you're at it, if you'd be so kind to give me a boom on that like button. 
Mass Effect Infiltrator released on the same day as Mass Effect 3 for iOS and Android. This mobile game placed you in the shoes of Randall Esno, a Cerberus operative having already been through the Reaper tech implants and now working as a solo infiltration specialist. The game actually started off as something completely different. Named Mass Effect Corsair, it would have been a first person space travelling game for the Nintendo DS. The player would assume the role of a Han Solo type of character, travelling about the Terminus systems, picking up cargo, taking on missions and selling information back to the Alliance. During the development, they hit a couple of stumbling blocks. Because it was to be a spacecraft game along the lines of Star Control, fitting it into already established lore of the FTL travel and the other being the actual cost of making the game. Veteran ex-Bioware producer Mark Dara would say in an interview that the cartridges needed for Mass Effect Corsair cost $10.50 each and with the DS games retailing at $30, it meant very little money for development costs after the cartridges had been purchased and localization had been paid for. That was the problem ultimately, he said. We know how to make big games, not games that have to control their cogs, and it didn't make sense. EA was predicting would only sell 50,000 copies. And so with the only beginnings of flight control developed, the project was cancelled. The assets would be passed to Iron Monkey Studios, who were known for their dead space work on mobiles, and so Mass Effect Infiltrator was born. The game takes place at the same time as Mass Effect 3 and acted as a companion to the main game. There's no requirement to play it to understand Mass Effect 3 and unlike Galaxy, it didn't feature any mainline characters. Nothing is referenced and the only benefits from playing it were a war asset to put towards the effect of military strength and the ability to see some of the war from the Cerberus point of view, although that is brief, but more on that in just a moment. The official plot summary goes like this. You are a Cerberus agent, gone rogue. As Commander Shepard battles Reapers across the galaxy, veteran Cerberus agent Randall Esno procures aliens for illicit experiments and a secret facility. But when the director of this facility goes too far, Randall fights back and vows to bring Cerberus down. Cerberus infiltrator Randall Esno is deployed to capture a high value Torian target. Guided by his handler and technician, Inali Renata, the mission doubles as a live field test for his latest augmentations and a sort of tutorial. After completing a mission on the ice planet, Randall returns to the barn, a Cerberus research station. On his way to visit his advisor, Inali Renata, something goes wrong and the Torian soldiers begin attacking the facility. During the attack, Randall tries to contact Inali, but she's cut off by someone. Randall hurries to Inali's location to ensure she's safe. After fighting past the Turian invaders, Randall is shocked to find Inali suffering through horrific experiments at the behest of the director of the barn. Randall vows revenge and goes in search of the director, now having to fight past the facility's Cerberus defences. While trying to escape, Randall is contacted by a mysterious voice via his earpiece. The voice claims to be a Volus working for the Alliance. He tells Randall that he can escape the facility and contact the Alliance, both he and Inali can be saved. Randall slowly makes his way forward to the communications tower, fighting Cerberus troops, escape test subjects, mechs, and X-1, a massive mutant Krogan. Finally, he reaches the comm tower, signals the Alliance, and heads to a nearby desert planet for a shuttle to pick up. After Randall arrives, Inali shows up, augmented beyond recognition, and starts to shoot Randall. After lowering her barrier and armor bars, the director takes complete control of Inali for the remainder of the fight. In the end, Randall either spares or kills Inali, depending on the player's previous morality choices. He then vows to kill the director for what he has done and leaves the planet. The controls of the game are specifically designed for touchscreen devices, and the center of the screen is used to launch the aiming mode. The left side of the screen was used for movement, moving to cover and some abilities. The right side of the screen was used for changing the camera view, the direction of your movement, and to adjust your aim when you're in the aiming mode. Unlike Mass Effect Galaxy, there were no conversation options in Infiltrator. All conversations took part either via your headset or in cutscenes. However, you still had the option to make Paragon or Renegade choices, and this changed the colour of your facial implants, and the game would calculate your overall morality, determining which ending you would get with the final Paragon or Renegade choice being made for you. There was also an impressive amount of weapons and biotic powers to choose from. I never really played past the second level, for although it looked really good for a mobile game, it would drain the battery really quickly. I also found that the combat was quite difficult when it came to the boss fights. Thankfully though, you could earn money from completing missions, which then you could use to upgrade your armor. 
If I'd known that game would have been removed from the store, I would have made more of an effort to play and complete it. It also suffered from Star Warsism, and by that, I mean when there's a rare chance that you actually get to play as an antagonist, which is a refreshing change. It's usually followed up by a switch to the light side or a crisis of conscience, turn the player from the antagonist to the hero. It's a shame that both these games, although not essential to the Mass Effect main game, does exist in the lore and are lost forever. It's understandable, as with every new mobile update, the games and the apps also need to be updated too, and if nobody's going to be buying an old game, then what's the point of having development teams keeping the games working on a new generation of hardware? It would be nice if they could turn them into a comic or maybe a couple of short film animations so that they're preserved for new people to enjoy, even if it's not in their original form. But going from two Mass Effect games you can't play anymore to one I really think that you should check out, and you can do that in this video right here. Thank you to the Nerdy Dude, the supporters, and you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Commander.